Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. Thank you so much for joining this virtual event. And thank you also to those of you who may be watching this event uh, after it's been recorded. This is uh, the third seminar in a series on the impact of high agricultural commodity and fertilizer prices on low and middle income countries. Today, we examine the disruptions in the fertilizer sector caused by the invasion of Ukraine and the impact these may have on productivity around the world. Our distinguished speakers will also provide their views on policies and actions ranging from the short to the longer run to address concerns about fertilizer availability and affordability. It's my pleasure to ask Sventor Holsitter to kick us off. Um, Sventor is the president and CEO of Yara International. He also serves as the chairman of the International Fertilizer Association. He's on a number of other uh, very important uh, organizations. He, I, I would just like to highlight that he also serves as the chair of the Food and Nature Program at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Yara is probably well known to many of you. It is one of the largest fertilizer companies um, with operations in no less than 60 countries, producing fertilizers in Europe, in the Americas, Africa, and Asia. Uh, Sventori, we're delighted that you're uh, here with us today, and please do speak to us about what you think are the key considerations today from an industry perspective. Thank you, uh, Charles, both for the introduction and the uh, opportunity to, to speak at this very important uh, seminar. And it comes at a very crucial point in time as, um, as well. And if you go to the, to the first slide, let me explain uh, a little bit, uh, might be uh, very known to many, but uh, to, just to uh, the very origin of our company and, and uh, also how relevant what we, the world uh, faced 120 years ago is to what we're facing Today, if you go back to, uh, to, to 1905, Europe was at the brink of famine as um, farmers were not able to keep up with the population growth. And uh, even though 78% of the year that we breathe is nitrogen, it's not available to, to plants directly from, um, from the air. So it needed to be uh, added in, in fixed form. And that was the great challenge to the scientists at, the, at that time. And it was sold by uh, our founder, uh, Professor uh, Birkiland in, in Oslo, Norway, uh, where he was able to use uh, uh, hydroelectric power to uh, extract nitrogen from the air. That was the very start of our company in, in 1905. And today we're, we're operating in, as Charles said, uh, 60 countries across the world. And just to highlight, if you go to the next slide, the importance of, um, of uh, fertilizers um, uh, today, um, half of the world gets uh, food as a res direct result of um, uh, fertilizers. Uh, and uh, if, if you look at uh, life-saving innovations, uh, it is the single most important in the, in the development in, uh, in global health by, by far and has uh, saved an estimated 2.7 billion uh, lives. And to explain why this is important, if we go to uh, the next slide and how fertilizer actually actually works, um, it, it's it's about uh, getting nutrition to uh, to plants, and um, uh, plants need a number of uh, nutrients in order to 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 grow. And it's, uh, as illustrated here on um, on this slide, uh, we see how uh, the plant grows um, above uh, the soil, but uh, uh, even more important is what is happening uh, uh, in the soil and, and how the plants uh, absorb the, uh, the, the nutrients and how important it is to have a balanced nutrition for, uh, for the plants uh, as well, because plants are just like us humans. We need uh, a balanced diet or balanced nutrition in order to grow and to be, be healthy. And if there's a lack of these uh, nutrients, uh, the plant will have uh, deficiencies. Uh, and uh, just to, to, to point out one on, on nitrogen, as you see here, uh, second furthest to the, uh, to, to the right, um, if, if, if the uh, nitrogen is not available in the soil, the plant will use its energy and will reach into the ground in order to, to find nitrogen with the resulting impact that the crop itself is becoming just uh, much smaller and, and, and weaker, as you see on the, on the picture. But if you have all the, the, the nutrients, uh, then you see to the left on, on this picture that uh, it's a very healthy 
and uh, and strong and, and productive um, plant. Um, so with that as a backdrop, what we're faced with um, uh, right now is, is a very challenging uh, situation for, um, for, for, for the world. Uh, if, we, if we go to the next um, uh, slide, we, um, we're in a, a dire situation right now and uh, we strongly condemn the Russian invasion into Ukraine. Um, and. Uh, uh, we have also warned uh, about the impact on food uh, security. The, the, the price shock that um, is a direct result of uh, Russia being excluded from the global uh, uh, system was expected. Uh, and uh, uh, what we're also seeing is uh, that the, the, the world uh, fertilizer market has become overly dependent on a single country which is uh, clearly uh, shown here on the on the market shares and, and the importance of Russian um, fertilizer into the world markets uh, and um, uh, this is a, a very clear reminder that we, we must and, and we can uh, avoid food shortages uh, if we, if we ma maximize crop uh, production and and uh, right now uh, rising food prices are hitting the most uh, vulnerable and, and we need to uh, provide them with the, with the means to buy um, uh, to buy food and these are the people that uh, uh, have been the hardest hit by the climate change they are the ones that uh, were um, uh, hardest hit by by um, by covid um, and now also hardest hit by the by the cost uh, increases uh, and uh, developing New sources of fertilizer or additional fertilizers uh, take takes time, but uh, but it is very clear that um, we, we we need to, um, to to work on diversifying uh, the markets uh, and and whatever we can to uh, support uh, both the farmers and, and and the populations where most. Uh, Needed. Um, then uh, my my final slide, uh, looking into the into the future, uh, what, what we are doing at the, at this moment is uh, uh, trying to to do whatever we can to to optimize the the, the nutrient the management and and, and, and precision farming, uh, may, making uh, tools available such as adapt and at farm Yara Eric's farm weather and uh, farm water uh, in order to. Uh, help uh, precision farming for for the farmers, uh, both for professional large scale farmers, but also for smallholder farmers. Because uh, for fertilizer, it's not a straight line on the yields. On, on um, when you add the fertilizer, it's uh, it um, it's very steep in the beginning, and, and then it levels off. So to find the right uh, amount of fertilizer, given the the crop prices and um, and the, and the need to uh, to have the right um, crop sizes will be uh, key here. So so the resulting part of that is that we will be able to get more food with less uh, fertilizer. There's but less waste. It's, it's less um, emissions and improved uh, livelihoods. And we have to do this now in in the midst of this um, uh, crisis. It's also a reminder that we need to reuse um, uh, materials uh, and. Uh, um, uh, materials for for uh, fertilization um, and, and that's as old as agriculture itself uh, but we, we can still scale it up uh, and uh, by collecting more uh, and uh, processing waste uh, in, in better ways and recovering uh, quality re uh, nutrients from um, from processed uh, waste and, and and we are working in in partnership with uh, Veolia and, and the city of London as an example where we are building up now a new portfolio of um, uh, organic um, fertilizer products. And then um, uh, our, our um, scientists are then using um, that source and, 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 and uh, combining or organic uh, uh, fertilizer uh, with mineral uh, nutrients in order to foster the, the, the right combination to make sure it's, it's a balanced uh, uh, nutrition for the, for the plants. Um, then it's also about changing the production processes themselves because we have to solve two things at the same time. Now it's about food security, producing more food, but also doing it with, with less uh, 
emissions. The, the food system represents 25 to 30 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. And as we saw in the report from the UN climate panel, as late as in, in February, it, 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 um, uh, it's an alarming report about the, the impact to, to climate and, and uh, we definitely have a role to play in agriculture as, uh, as well. And at the same time, we need to grow more food for a growing uh, population uh, 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 right now. And um, uh, it, at Yara, we've reduced our emissions by, um, by, by 50% uh, since uh, 2005. And the next step here is to change the pro production process itself, moving away from fossil fuels and using renewable energy to produce uh, fertilizers. And one such example is to, to move from using natural gas to produce hydrogen, uh, and but rather go then for uh, electrolyzers to produce green hydrogen to turn that into green ammonia and then into green green fertilizer and uh, i'm pleased to to say that we already signed our first contract on with the swedish farmer co-op the uh, lundman to to produce green hydrogen we made the first step to convert our largest plant and uh, indeed today we launched uh, uh, in the stock market uh, with a press release that we're looking into a potential ipo of um our uh, Yara clean ammonia to to help to accelerate that uh, that growth, uh, but it is in something that needs uh, support. It needs support from governments. I'm not asking for a first movers advantage, but I'm asking to 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 be at least first movers neutral. That this is a collective effort between uh, governments and companies and and the ag business in order to make this uh, transition. So um, I will keep it uh, there for now, uh, Charlotte, and um, I'll, I look forward to take part in the in the discussion later on in the in the seminar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sventor, for emphasizing the need to diversify uh, fertilizer supply, but also for paying attention to the very important environmental issues. And perhaps this crisis can actually be helpful, if one may say that, in terms of uh, making more progress on the important issues you highlight: nutrient management using more renewables for producing uh, fertilizers and also uh, doing more on nutrient recycling. And congratulations on your, on your IPO. That sounds uh, very, very exciting. We're now moving to exactly the other end of the, uh, the, the value chain. And uh, that is the farmers uh, who are of course the users of fertilizers. I'm really pleased that we have Theo de Jaeger with us. Um, Theo is the president of the World Farmers Organization which is a, a collection of national farmers organizations and cooperatives from around the globe. And they have a very important role of bringing forward the voices of farmers in some of the key international institutions and processes. Theo is also a farmer, uh, although I'm not sure how much time he actually has to farm. But uh, thank you so much, Theo, for talking to us about what are you hearing from your membership about this situation? Thank you very much, Charlotte. Really a privilege to present the farmer's voice in, in such an important discussion. What am I hearing? It doesn't matter to whom you speak. If you're speaking to a farmer, whether in North America or Oceania, even in the Ukraine and in Russia, the main talk amongst farmers is fertilizers, the availability and the price of fertilizers. You know, between those two countries, Ukraine and Russia, we, we get around 20% of the world's fertilizers. And already the global demand have risen by 6,3% in 2021. This complaining by farmers about the price and the availability of fertilizer is nothing new. It came from last year. And the, the COVID restrictions, we have already seen a drop in the, the supply. But now the prices are more or less 78,5% higher than the average of 2021. And this is what is cracking up the um, production side of agriculture. You see, we have seen in the WFO that in many regions, farmers simply cannot afford to bring fertilizers to the farms or even if they could, the fertilizers are not available close to them. And I will come back to those areas in a short while. 
the, the interesting part is that many fields are not being planted, even though the opportunity has presented itself. Where farmers have been urged by governments, such as here in Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, various parts of Latin America, to plant more wheat and sunflower this year, farmers feel that it is not worthwhile to risk it on marginal fields. The Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, talked about this some three weeks ago when he referred to the food, energy, and financing crisis. Because it is also about how to get farmers to, to, to afford the fertilizer, how to finance them in the production cycle. In Mauritius and in Ivory Coasts, farmers said, that many of them simply have not planted this season. In the European Union and European countries, the, the fertilizers are available, although very expensive this year. The, the fear is rather for the profit margins. Farmers ask, is it worthwhile taking the risk to plant if we do not know that the price we get for the products will not match the ri rise in the cost of inputs? Because you must remember, it is not only fertilizers. It is also shortages in agrochemicals and fuels um, and, and a number of other smaller inputs on the input budget for a farmer. Now, this crisis is a global one, so it needs a global response. This is why we really welcome um, Antonio Guitre's uh, call for uh, what he calls a global crisis response group. And we are glad that we have been invited to join this group. We need to assist a number of countries, a number of policymakers with advice, with guidance, with financial assistance to meet this challenge. If the world doesn't kind of help farmers this year to get to production, we must expect a shortage in production. I'm not so sure from the farmer side that it is possible anymore to avoid a food crisis. The, the question would rather be how wide and how deep it would be. Well, there's a more fundamental question. That kind of question comes from the firm belief that farmers need peace, but more than that, Peace needs farmers. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you very much, Theo. Um, those are some, some very um, sobering remarks about the situation that farmers are facing. I, I think the, the, the risk that now uh, production may not be worth it because you're not actually able to recoup the costs of your inputs is obviously very worrisome um, given the, the shortage or the high prices we see on the ag commodity price uh, side. And the, this situation will risk to um, extend those high prices on, on the ag side. So, so very problematic. Thank you also very much for bringing up the, the very important effort um, by Secretary General Guterres. Um, IFPRI as well as IFA are also part of that group. And we understand that the next report by the Global Crisis um, Group will address fertilizers uh, in particular as well. So with that, uh, let me now turn to IFA, um, the International Fertilizer Association. We're so happy to have with us Laura Cross, who serves as the Director of Market Intelligence um, at IFA. She has a very distinguished career. She's worked with many different consultancies, also on fertilizers. So we're delighted to have you with us, Laura. You're, you're going to talk to us a little bit more about what are, what's really driving these, these price increases. Uh, what happened prior to the invasion of Ukraine and, and how has that uh, uh, further contributed to the situation we find ourselves in today? Yes, thank you, Charlotte. Um, and just to check that you can see my screen, that it's sharing correctly. Excellent. Perfect. And so good morning, everyone. And thank you to IFPRI and to Charlotte for the invitation to present to you all today. Um, following a very inspiring uh, presentation from Theo, I will have more of a uh, potentially academic or data-driven 
presentation, but hopefully what you'll see from this is the data to back up some of the fundamentals that, that Theo has described that farmers are seeing today when it comes to fertilizers. So first off, to get us started with the current situation when it comes to fertilizer prices, we're in an environment of extremely high price levels. And the metric that is really important here when we're talking about fertilizer prices is the balance between fertilizer prices and crop prices. Anytime there is a disconnect between the finished product price that a farmer can expect compared to its input costs, then we have a discussion of affordability. Can a farmer actually afford to buy the fertilizer to use on their crops? And therefore, what impact does that have on production and yields? And if we go back slightly to the historical relationship between fertilizer prices crop prices and consumption, you'll see on the far right hand side of this chart that 6.3% demand growth last year that Theo referred to. But I actually want to take you back to the 2008-2009 situation when there was very much an affordability issue for farmers when it came to their fertilizer decision making. And what that resulted in was a significant drop in fertilizer consumption in the year 2008-9 and then all of us are very familiar with what happened after that and the impact that that had on global food availability and food pricing. So if I move now to what actually drives fertilizer prices, and I could talk for uh, many, many minutes and hours on the drivers behind fertilizer prices, but in the interest of time, I'm going to give you a 101 on what actually drives the market when it comes to fertilizer. And in this situation, the starting point is typically supply and demand. Global fertilizer prices are market driven. They're typically determined by the balance between how much is available and how much is consumed in any given crop season. Now this supply demand balance is typically underpinned by production costs. So what is the cost of a fertilizer producer to put that production into the into the global market. Now prices also vary with uh, agricultural seasonality and the timing of fertilizer purchases in a year. And especially coming back to that point I made about crop prices, we have in addition to that, the ability to pay for fertilizers, access to credit, and also foreign exchange. So countries that are actually importing their fertilizers will have a different relationship with prices than others. And then finally, there are a number of in-season drivers. So as you can see on the list here, weather, planting progress, trade dis disruption, which is something that we'll come on to, and a number of other political factors all have an impact on global fertilizer prices. And just to touch on uh, something that, again, Theo mentioned, he set me up very well for, for my slides here, um, which is the fact that this isn't the first uh, period within recent history when fertilizer prices have been high. In 2021, following on from COVID-19, we actually were already in a high fertilizer price environment. And you can see here some of the main drivers behind that. There was very strong fertilizer demand in response to food security goals. There were also supply chain disruptions not related to trade and conflict, but to other drivers. Raw material prices were higher, including natural gas, which many of you will be aware of. And then these domestic policy policies um, and global disruptions that were just starting to creep in in that period of time. Now, something else I want to highlight is just a very quick overview of the structure of the fertilizer market. And it's important to say that the global spread of production historically have been mostly dictated by the presence of natural resources. So in the case of nitrogen or ammonia here, it's natural gas or energy feedstock. For phosphates, it's the presence of phosphate rock. And for potash, it's the presence of phosphate of potash ore. Now, you will see on these charts, there are some countries that you may not imagine have the largest or the lowest cost availability of these resources. 
on the nitrogen side, China and India are good examples of this. So this is where there are some parts of the world where a country's domestic strategy to fertilize a supply also plays a role on the production. Now, looking to the bottom of this slide, another really important driver of the fertilizer market, and this comes back to Centore's opening remarks, is how reliant on global trade the fertilizer market is. So even for a very heavily traded and highly abundant product such as urea, still about a third of that product around the world transfers over a country border before it's consumed. If you go to the slightly more concentrated industries um, like potash, you can see a really overwhelmingly majority of the world is reliant on traded product. And what that means is that the world is heavily exposed to trade disruptions um, that may impact the supply of these fertilizer products. Now, with that in mind, thinking about where the major producers of fertilizer are around the world, it's been quite highly publicized how much fertilizer supply comes from the current countries that are seeing sanctions as a result of the activity in Ukraine. And something that I think is really important to highlight is it's true around 20% of total fertilizer that is traded comes from countries such as Russia. There's also a difference in the different products. So if we take a fertilizer like potash, once you account for the impact of sanctions on Russia and the sanctions on Belarus that were implemented last year, you're looking at 41% of global trade being impacted in 2022. Now that presents some serious challenges for the countries around the world that are reliant on imports from these countries. And this is where we start to get into a bit more of the complex nature of the problem that we're facing here. So some of the largest regions that are impacted um, by this supply from, from Russia and Belarus are Europe, Latin America, and South Asia. This is in volume terms, but also on the back of a geographical perspective, if you think about Europe. But it's important to take account of the countries that are also impacted by affordability and by the ability to actually purchase this product. So this is where countries in, in regions like Africa come into play. This is really quite a challenging situation if you're dealing with a large reliance on supply from these areas. And there's a number of drivers that dictate whether a country is able to purchase product in a supply restricted environment. These can range from how much of the imports uh, account for total consumption, whether there is any domestic supply in the country. But it also can relate to things like whether a country has access to an export market for its grains, whether a country is highly reliant on these two sources from Russia and Belarus, or whether they have other trade partners already in place. And that's what um, David from IFPRI is going to pick up on now is some of these drivers that actually impact the ability to purchase fertilizers uh, and what that looks like in 2022. So on that note, and, and in the interest of time, I'll, I'll stop it there. Thank you again for the introduction. And uh, I look forward to discussing in the Q&A any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, for highlighting the, the important role of trade in, in making sure that fertilizers get to farmers and also the re-emphasizing the point about, you know, can we diversify the, the fertilizer supply given, given the um, reliance on a few key countries? Um, obviously, that's not something that can be done from one day to the next, but it's, it's a very important issue to, to highlight. Let me remind our audience that um, when we are finished with, uh, with the speakers, we will be very keen to move to the Q&A session. So please do submit your questions. You can do that on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using the hashtag AskIfpre on Twitter. Um, as Laura said, we're now moving on to uh, David Laborde, uh, my colleague at IFPRI. David serves as a senior research fellow and has done some really um, very important analysis on, on the crisis we find ourselves in, both with regard to food and fertilizer prices. 
He's speaking to us today about um, country exposure to the crisis um, and picking up on uh, additional problems uh, in, in the form of export restrictions, which have been uh, uh, applied. Over to you, David. Thank you, Charlotte, um, and good morning and good afternoon, everyone, for, for joining us today. So um, I'm going to talk in five minutes on the, yes, the, the specific situation about how trade flows uh, are currently impacted by uh, the crisis and the response to the crisis, but also some drivers that were here before this specific crisis. Uh, you will find on the IFPRI website some blogs talking about the crisis, in particular one on this fertilizer issue that I had the pleasure to uh, write with, with Charlotte. And we have also an online interface to access various data on the uh, fertilizer uh, market and situation. Uh, and I'm going to use some of them uh, during my, my presentation now. Next slide, please. So as it had been said, uh, uh, first, at, in average, fertilizers are heavily traded uh, uh, globally. Uh, of course, nitrogenous fertilizers are a bit less traded because you have more opportunity to produce them locally, even if in many cases, you still have to import some of the feedstock like coal or natural gas. But when you go beyond the average, and uh, on this screen, you see three maps that show uh, the imports um, versus your agricultural use ratio, uh, meaning basically how much you import of the fertilizer in terms of nitrogen, uh, phosphate, or, or potash. And if you are really red on this map, it means that basically you import more or less everything that you consume. And uh, obviously, depending on the product, depending on what you have locally, uh, this situation is going to, uh, to change. So if you're in Canada, you produce potash and actually you don't really import potash, but you are going to import phosphate. And if you're in China, you uh, produce nitrogenous uh, fertilizer and actually phosphate, but you need to import potash. But as you see on this map, uh, you have first uh, most African countries and actually also most of the Latin American countries that rely heavily uh, on uh, world markets to provide their own uh, fertilizer, uh, but also countries like Australia. So a lot of actually food exporters need to import their fertilizer. And that's one of the main risks here is really the whole value chain can be disrupted, um, either if you are in a small uh, and poor economies in Africa, or actually if you're in a very uh, advanced and export oriented, you will face similar difficulties. And that's where the situation is highly challenging. Next slide, please. But at the same time, you have seen, you know, values even within a continent, within the region, you will see countries that are more or less exposed. And so, you know, local um, knowledge and local response are important. On this screen, now uh, I'm showing the kind of exposure we have to the uh, supply from Belarus and Russia. So uh, Belarus is specialized in uh, potash export, but as we discussed before, actually Russia has a big share on uh, all the type of fertilizer, even if it's particularly strong for uh, potash and, and nitrogenous. Uh, and so you see on uh, the map on, on the left side also how for uh, the three type of fertilizer, how countries depend on uh, this region. Now, even within one specific region like West Africa, you will see some country depending much more on Belarus, or on Russia, you know, you don't rely on the same country at all the time, but you see this situation. So the specific description coming from uh, the war, uh, but also from the sanctions, and some of them are predating the war because Belarus was targeted by sanctions before um, actually the invasion of Ukraine. You are creating problems to access to this fertilizer, including for a number of third party countries. And that explains uh, some of the, the issue we, we, we talked today. On the right hand side of my of um, of the, the screen, you will see so basically a scatter plot. So each dot is a country. The bigger the dot, the bigger the imports. And on one axis, we show how much uh, their dependency to world market. So the first map, and on the vertical axis, how much is dependent um, from Ukraine, uh, Russia, and, and Belarus. Um, and therefore, that's a combination, if you want, of the two maps. And that helps us to see, you know, which regions can be really exposed. Some because, you know, like Mongolia, they actually import everything and they import a lot from uh, Russia and Belarus. Similarly, Ukraine imports a lot of fertilizer. 
coming uh, until now from uh, Russia and Belarus, and obviously for the future of Ukraine, that will be a challenge. But you will find this tool online, so if you want to investigate more, uh, you will see. But really, the crisis itself has a specific story. Next slide, please. But last but not least, we also have seen a number of export restrictions. So they can take different shape and form from a very extreme one that is an export ban where people cannot export to various export taxes to a various level of licensing or uh, inspection, but more or less, it makes trade more difficult. And some of this is, as I said, predating even the invasion, but just with rising prices of fertilizer, but also rising prices of inputs, uh, we start to see a bit more of this measure, even if they have actually started significantly in October last year. And as of today, we have 20% of the, the exports of, of fertilizer that are limited in one way or another. And if the my previous slide, uh, I was kind of giving the focus on potash and nitrogenous uh, fertilizer because they come a lot from Belarus and, uh, and Russia. Actually, these export restrictions uh, have also a significant impact on phosphate uh, due to uh, the role that China is playing on, on this market in particular. So at the end, all these different products are impacted. And that's really this combination of policies that uh, put uh, restriction on, on trade, either from the exporter point of view or the importer from the point of view who the set up sanction. And that shrink the global market, puts prices up, and the higher the price, the more we can see countries putting more restrictions. So here there is a very a vicious circle that has to be uh, stopped and hopefully with more cooperation uh, between countries and also between uh, public and, and the private sector. And I am done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, David. Um, and just encourage all of you in the audience to go online to find the fertilizer dashboard and the export restrictions tracker which David has put into place um, for, for IFPRI. Um, <clears throat> we've actually already, prior to the beginning of this seminar, uh, received a lot of questions. And, and I'm just gonna quickly read two of them because our next presentation will address these. Um, we're being asked to reflect on the opportunities presented by alternative organic approaches to enhancing soil fertility. Uh, what could be sustainable alternatives to fertilizers that farmers, especially from low income countries, can apply to their crops? Um, we have Bernard Ben Lau, um, who unfortunately could not end up joining us, but he's been very um, nice to send us his presentation. He serves as the Director for uh, Research for Development in Central Africa and Natural Resource Management at the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, a sister organization of IFPRI within the CGIR. Prior to that, Bernard was at another um, CGIR center, CIAT, the Center for um, International Agricultural uh, at, in the Tropics where he worked on integrated soil fertility management. Um, so let's hear from Bernard and uh, he will be addressing many of these kinds of questions. Uh, good day, everyone. I'm going to talk about nutrient use efficiency and soil health considerations. My name is Bernard van Loewe and I'm working for the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture based in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, I apologize for not being able to participate in live in this event because I was called unexpectedly for a, for a mission in, in DR Congo. Now, very often when people talk about soil health, they refer to soil carbon. And we know that from experience that improving yields is one of the most viable pathways to improve soil health. This is, these are data from um, recent meta-analyses which clearly shows that there is a positive relation between annual change in crop productivity and, and relative annual change in soil organic carbon content. There is a lot of scatter in this graph, a lot of unexplained variation, but the relation is positive. We also know at the same time that yields in sub-Saharan Africa are often very low, often a figure of one to two tons per hectare is mentioned. But we know that moving from that one to two tons to three tons can really be relatively easily achieved by giving farmers improved access to seed and fertilizer 
it's much more of a logistical problem, I would say, than, than a technical issue. Moving to the next level from 3 to 5 tons often requires interventions also across the agriculture value chain to provide farmers with the incentives to reinvest in their production systems. And moving from 5 to 10 tons is probably agronomically possible, but will require new technologies and, and are beyond the scope of short term interventions. So it is possible using current technology to move from relatively low yields to yields that are acceptable and that will ultimately um, increase uh, soil carbon and improve soil health. Now, to get this done, fertilizer use efficiency is really critical. And we know that traditionally the response curve usually looks like this with um, a linear part in, in, in on the left side of the response curve, ultimately resulting in a plateau as you apply more and more nutrients. And we also know that the agronomic efficiency is high and constant for the initial linear part of the response curve, but, but goes down quite rapidly as nutrients are supplied um, and towards the level, the plateau level of a response curve. That first part, that linear part, is actually the part where agronomic efficiency is constant. That's very important because we know that agronomic efficiency, which is defined as the increase in yield over nutrients applied, is directly related to a key economic indicator, like, for instance, the value generated over costs incurred. So in that blue part of the response curve, agronomic efficiency is constant, and, and so are the economic indicators related to that. So it gives flexibility to farmers to get the best out of their purchased nutrients um, in that particular blue space. For many smallholder farmers, agronomic efficiency is then also best maximal for economic reasons. Um, and of course, environmental arguments also support the maximum agronomic efficiency. We also know at the same time from a lot of recent studies and with older studies, and you see a list here, that the agronomic efficiency in kilogram A per kilogram N is often quite low. You see values here between 8 and maximum reaching, um, you know, 5, 14, 15 to 21. At the same time, we know that under well-managed conditions, and these are just um, data from um, meta-analysis, you can relatively easily get to 30 or, or even higher if, if your fertilizer is managed well. So agronomic efficiencies of less than 15 kilogram grain per kilogram nutrient are low. And if we manage that input well, we can easily get 30 or higher. Now, how do we get that fertilizer efficiency to levels that are acceptable for, as I said, for economic and environmental reasons? I think we know a lot about this topic, and I'm just going to quickly scan through a number of slides supporting evidence for how to best increase use efficiencies. Um, number one, of course, the four R's, I think we all heard about that. So number one is you absolutely need to manage your fertilizer well. Second thing, you need to absolutely manage your crop well in terms of appropriate weeding regimes, timely planting, and so on. So good agronomic practices are equally important to in, ensure that your nutrients are, are used efficiently. Thirdly, you need to absolutely use improved adapted varieties, disease-resistant varieties. Without an appropriate demand for nutrients, your use efficiency can never be optimal. So use good varieties is a third principle. The fourth principle is mix fertilizer and organic matter because both of those inputs they have different functions they contribute differently to crop growth by addressing a diverse range of constraints to increase productivity so combine fertilizer and organic inputs and lastly address localized constraints if you have a soil with acidity problems or or a subsurface hardpan, you will need to address this before your fertilizer can be used efficiently. So in, in, um, we usually summarize these principles under the heading Integrated Soil Fertility Management. 
which is defined here. So it's a set of fertility management practices that necessarily include the use of fertilizer, organic inputs, and improved germplasm, aiming at maximizing the agronomic use efficiency of applied nutrients. And all inputs need to be managed following sound agronomic principles. Um, this is really summarizing um, a lot of learning over the past decades on, on how to best manage tropical soils. Now, there is one statement here in gray that I've not mentioned yet, and this is very much related to a typically, I would say, smallholder um, phenomenon, which is, which is very common in, in African smallholder agriculture. This is, for instance, um, an irrigation scheme in the Brazilian Cerrados. The, the diameter of the circle is one kilometer. So this is about 79 hectares of land. And you can see that the crop, this is probably maize, looks quite homogeneous throughout. So any recommendation for any spot in this particular area would probably apply to any other spot in the same area. Now, if you look at the same surface, we go into Google Maps and we look at the scene from Western Kenya. This is what we are seeing. So you see all shades of green and brown and very likely any recommendation to maximize use efficiency for any particular spot in this landscape may not be valid even a few hundred meters away. And we've seen that if you look at, for instance, one farm and you look at this, these two fields, which are colored, uh, green and red, and if you zoom in on them, this is often what you see. Um, the poor soil, you see a picture here, and the good soil, you see a picture down down left. This maize was planted on the same farm using the same variety, the same input, same management, same weather, and we can obviously see that there's a huge difference in um, in crop performance and, and this at, at very short distances. This is a common phenomenon in a lot of farms in sub-Saharan Africa. Before long, it was very hard to integrate this phenomenon into recommendations and, and fertility management support. But with recent developments in um, analytics and data science, um, we are now able to also address this very hyper-local variation and still come up with um, recommendations that make sense, that take into account that variability. This is an example we've been developing over the past years, a platform we call Akilimo, which is really trying to develop site-specific recommendations for, um, in this case, for cassava, but currently being expanded to potato, maize and other crops. And it basically consists of um, an assembly of all sorts of tools that are needed to go into locally relevant um, agronomy recommendations at scale. So there is, there is the data, the crop modeling, the geospatial layers, there's a cloud-based prediction engine, a database um, system. And there's interfaces that allow interactions with farmers or extension agents, either via digital or, or more traditional printable tools. So in short, that gray sentence we can now say confidently that we are able to also address this component of integrated soil fertility management, which is really saying um, integrating the knowledge on how to adapt all those practices to local conditions, which can vary very substantially. Are there any alternatives to fertilizer? Um, we know there are isobium inoculants. We know they are cheap, easy to apply, and good chances for favorable economic returns. This is an example for soybean in Zimbabwe. In IT, we've also been developing um, a Nodimax product, a legume inoculant for, for a soybean with a very high shelf life, and easily you get 20 to 30 percent yield increases. But at the same time, we've seen that a lot of other biostimulants, as they are often called, are really not effective. These are some examples from products that were available on the, on the Kenyan market that we've tried to test um, against a number of parameters. And we've seen that most of them are really not adding, adding much of um, extra benefits to crop growth. So farmers really been, better spend their scarce resources on fertilizer. Since reply, replacing an agro input that's expensive with another agro input which is ineffective is not going to get us nowhere. 
What about switching from mineral to organic inputs? And of course, this is being mentioned quite a lot uh, nowadays because of the very high fertilizer prices. But some years ago, I actually produced this, this uh, opinion piece, which is really saying that it's time to really end that false debate of whether we should go organic or mineral. Because both inputs have different compositions and functions, and farmers really need to, need to, need to have both. Secondly, farmers also can't produce enough organic matter without mineral fertilizer. And thirdly, organic farming also requires inputs. So some concluding remarks, crop, crop productivity and soil health are intrinsically linked. And under the current economic conditions, the focus should really be on maximizing fertilizer use efficiencies. Integrated soil fertility management is constructed around the efficient use of fertilizer as an entry point for enhancing productivity and embeds a set of good agronomic principles and the need for local adaptations. While the principles are based on a large body of information, advances in data analytics and approaches now allows the operationalization of local adaptation. To increase yields and improve soil health, there are no viable alternatives to fertilizer. Some biostimulants can assist in improving crop, crop growth, but those will not replace fertilizer. And, and lastly, the question is not how to switch from fertilizer to organic inputs, but how to devise farming systems that allow for the use of both inputs, um, which support different um, crop and, and soil management functions. Thanks for listening and comments and suggestions are very welcome. Really a big thanks to Bernard for presenting us um, these, these very important points. Um, there, there's so much that is included in there. I, I just want to highlight his one of his key takeaways, which is the need to maximize um, use efficiency of fertilizer. Uh, that has been a longstanding issue. Unfortunately, the use efficiency is still quite low uh, in many parts of the world, and there are things that can be done to improve it. So perhaps, again, this crisis can lead uh, farmers and organizations that support farmers to increase the nutrient use efficiency. This is obviously important because we don't want to throw fertilizers away uh, when they're this expensive, but also given the very serious environmental implications that, that occur when fertilizers are not taken up by the crop and lost to the environment. So again, many, many thanks to Bernard for that uh, very important presentation. I think he's really set the scene nicely for our next speaker. We are now moving into a panel on regional and country perspectives. And our first speaker on this panel is Sebastian Nenduva, who's the program lead for AfricaFertilizer.org, which is managed by the International Fertilizer Development Center. Um, AfricaFertilizer.org, or AFO for short, is an organization that has been collecting, processing, and publishing fertilizer uh, sector statistics for key markets in Sub-Saharan Africa. They've done a really great job, um, and I'm now turning it over to Sebastian, who will talk to us about the availability and affordability concerns with regard to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Thanks, Sebastian. Thank you very much, Charlotte. And just reconfirming that everyone can see and hear me very well. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say thank you very much for the invitation to IFTC and by extension Africa Fertilizer the Org to lend our voice into this very burning issue on fertilizers, most so especially in Africa, given that Africa is a, a net importer and we highly dependent on meeting our farmers' needs through importation. So I do apologize in advance, my slide is a bit data heavy, but this is all in efforts to support uh, some of the sentiments that have been um, alluded to by the previous uh, speakers. So onto my first slide, you can actually see we did an estimation of current inventory in the African countries that we track, over about 20 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And it's clearly evident that the countries in red are actually lagging behind in terms of meeting their farmer requirements for this planting season. And when I do mention this planting season, um, it, it's different from west to east and south, but by and large, it is really urgent in terms of the requirements that are needed by the farmers. So to lend a regional perspective and just to show the importance of fertilizer in the African continent, um, West Africa accounts for about 40%, with uh, east and south accounting for about 60% of all fertilizers consumed. And out of these uh, figures, about 80% is actually imported. We have very few countries in Africa that are actually 
more or less self-reliant on fertilizers. Um, one of them being Nigeria, which accounts for about 70% domestic production, and the other 30% is actually augmented from importation. Um, we do have countries, we have tracked about uh, 20 countries, like I mentioned earlier, that have reported limited inventory. Limited in the sense that it's not able to meet uh, their former requirements for the planting season. So we did a, re a risk matrix. I do apologize for the very heavy, uh, the very heavy content in here, uh, but I'm, I'm assuming the slides will be shared to all um, to internalize at your own time. We can actually see from the east and south and the west, there are actually critical countries that need immediate interventions, given that they're about to get into their planting seasons. They have very limited inventory and by this cropping season, uh, we, we taken into account um, the time that you need to position cargo in time for it to land at your shores for, for planting or for utilization by your farmers. We've also analyzed um, the market in terms of how much of it is food and cash because this is a very key, key driver uh, of, of fertilizer usage. In West African countries, you'll find that the biggest consumers of fertilizers are cash crops, but further east, you'll find it's actually more of food markets. We also did an analysis on whether the markets are, have any sort of subsidy, um, whether uh, they're highly subsidized, partially subsidized or not, because this again also plays into how much fertilizer is required. So uh, as a deep dive into the 2022 demand situation, if I can start from the east and south section, you can actually see all the way from Kenya, uh, Tanzania, Malawi, Mozambique, Zambia, um, all having limited inventory due to various reasons. We've seen countries by and large, for example, if I can go on to Kenya, um, year on year, if I compare last year's uh, quarter one 2021 to quarter one 2022, we're down 36%. And this being the main application season, farmers are at their wit's end as to where they will get fertilizers. Countries like Tanzania, in as much as they're out of seasons, um, they are not, they have not been able to adequately position their cargo for quarter three, which is when they ideally more or less position cargo for usage in quarter four. Countries like Zambia um, are having an imminent tender, uh, but the government is actually rocking the brain as to where they will source the fertilizers from, with price and availability being a very key issue. If I move on to West African countries, we are seeing countries like Mali um, undergoing embargoes. Um, they're having cropping seasons imminent, but with critically low inventories. Uh, same case has been replicated in countries like Burkina Faso with only about 16% of their cropping requirements for this cropping season actually uh, within their borders. Countries like uh, Ghana have been severely hit. Last year, they were down 61% on total consumption figures. And up to date for this cropping season, they've only been, have been able to position about 38% of their entire demand, which is about 550,000 metric tons cumulative. Uh, we do have countries that uh, are doing better than others. Case in point, Nigeria, like I mentioned, they're a little bit hedged from the global risks, given that they have about 70% of their requirements coming from uh, domestic production. They also do have negotiated contracts uh, for phosphates um, with the main phosphate producers. And this in a way has actually led to them um, sort of having some bit of reliance and stability um, in this entire crisis. Uh, countries like Mexico, um, have more or less done a bit better than others, um, but having done better than others, uh, it's only that because their consumption figures are a little bit lower. So whatever they've been able to actually um, to obtain or source from the global markets, is more or less sufficient for their cropping needs. And like I'd mentioned, the key main issues now being availability and price. I would actually like to delve into three focus countries. This is Ghana, Nigeria, and Kenya. Uh, these countries have actually been um, sort of isolated or chosen based on their importance in the African market. And we've also had very, uh, very robust support from uh, the donor communities to sort of um, lend a, a more, a more fo focused uh, perspective in, into these countries. So if I start with Ghana, you can actually see a year-on-year -year comparisons for the last three years in terms of uh, 
importation for the quarter one, it's clearly evident that 2022 is lagging behind. Um, there's a very huge gap between the demand side and the supply side, uh, with MOP completely being unavailable, unavailable for blending. Uh, Russia, Ukraine, Belarus account for about 40% of all the potash that goes into West Africa. And by extension, Ghana being a high NPK consumer has been affected uh, by, this, uh, by this reality. So for this year, um, they are probably needing to source or to look also in terms of sourcing for their potash. Uh, this slide is basically just to keep, to put into perspective um, the importation in terms of product that they do get from Russia, Ukraine, and by extension, Belarus, which is not yet shown here. Same scenario for Nigeria. Um, as of presentation of this slide last week, the only importation for quarter one in 2022 had only been one vessel of DAB, which arrived sometime in April. This is to show you how far back they are lagging in terms of their importation to meet their requirements. If you do a 10 year comparisons from 2012, um, 2022 is not looking any better. I can actually compare the figures of 2022 as per the demand estimates that we have for that country into, into figures that we last had for 2016 uh, for Nigeria. So as to show you uh, the reliance um, from Russia and Ukraine uh, in terms of um, their, their, their utility, uh, they've only uh, imported about 25% in 2021, 49% from the previous year. But as of, as of now, as you speak, they've not imported anything from these two particular countries and they will have to look elsewhere. Actually, when we speak to uh, blenders and producers in West Africa, they are telling us that they are having to source, uh, to look for alternative sources for MOP to do their blending, um, because without that, there's gonna be an imbalance in their production, uh, and they're still figuring out what to do. For Kenya, and um, this is the last country of focus that I will have, it's also clearly evident that quarter one in 2022, is lagging behind in terms of availability of product, so much so that the government has had to step in to sort of do emergency uh, subsidy programs, which in my opinion are a little bit too late. Once again, as a comparison on where we get some of our products from, Russia and Ukraine, uh, as you can see from 2021, we had about 100,000 tons coming from these two markets, and 100,000 tons accounts for about um, twenty percent of the total consumption um, in Kenya. That is quite sizable. So for twenty twenty two, we've actually seen some of the tenders uh, issued by tea factories having been extended, um, with no clarity as to where they're going to source these particular grades of NPK. On to price, it's not very different. And then again, I'll still concentrate on the three countries: Nigeria, Ghana, and Kenya. It's clearly evident that the trend has been um, on an upward mobility. Uh, as from 2021, um, second quarter, uh, we started seeing rise in uh, feedstock prices, which had a snowballing effect in the rise of freights um, and eventually high landed CFR prices. Um, so comparing that to the local retail prices for these three countries, the trend seems very similar. We're having high retail prices right now. Uh, all the countries and all the farmers we've talked to are either having to scale down the amount of fertilizers that they are using, um, which in a way is more or less psychological. Uh, this will definitely be reflected on, on the yields later on during the harvest season. Um, as a regional perspective in terms of CFR comparisons, um, we pull this slide from Africa, and as of, as of end of April, you can clearly see the CFR networks um, for all the major African markets are at very elevated prices. These elevated uh, figures are having to be passed on to the farmers. And you can actually see COVID time in relation to uh, the Ukraine and Russia war. So it, it is, it is um, a very dire situation, just to put it in context, uh, with whichever market you look at. We have not seen any African market that has said that they are rather comfortable 
or um, are in a, in a good position to secure cargo for, for this particular cropping season. So what are the possible solutions or interventions that we see um, that uh, the stakeholders could, could, could sort of uh, exploit? One of them could be that governments could step in uh, to offer temporary subsidies that, we, that we've seen. We've seen countries like Kenya offering stopgap measures in terms of subsidizing product at the distribution chain, having to source it um, at very high levels on, this, on the global market, and then subsidizing on the landed cost. Um, some of the farmers, or some of the importers rather, that we've also spoken with in the continent um, are actually stating that financing is the biggest bottleneck in, in procuring cargo right now. Um, and I'll give you an example. A year ago, it, it, it will cost me about uh, $9 million to secure um, a, a 30,000 urea vessel in Eastern South Africa. Right now, it's going for about four times that. And financials are not accommodating or flexible enough to sort of match these elevated levels. So the importers have had to device um, very innovative ways, importing in very small quantities, in very small batches, just to get their business going back. Uh, the okay. other interventions... So, sorry, Sebastian, we need to wrap up. If you could finish your three points quickly, remaining ones. Thank you. Th thank you very much. The other intervention could be um, investing in local production for African countries. And I know this is something that's not going to happen overnight, but if you start going that direction, you definitely could um, help Africa head some of these global vagarities. The last point has already been touched on, on nutrient use efficiency, so I won't go into details on that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sebastian. A great presentation, a lot of detail. And uh, I should mention that IFDC is also part of this global crisis re response group that the UN has put together and is providing really vital information. In particular, right now, the emphasis is on West Africa, given the proximity of the, the cropping season just a few weeks away and the shortage of fertilizers. So many thanks for, for being with us, Sebastian. I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions. Um, we now move on to another recording. Uh, this one comes from China. Um, China is a huge producer and has been a very, very important um, participant in global trade of, of fertilizers. We're really grateful to the China Chamber of Commerce on Metals, Minerals, and Chemical Importers and Exporters to uh, be with us virtually today. Uh, Jingfen Jian is the vice president at the chamber. And I'm also very grateful to Erin Jang, who has done the voiceover for her in, in English. Let me just mention that the purpose of the chamber is it's essentially a association for the Chinese uh, industry. And one of the uh, roles they have is to study the economic and trade situation and um, look at statistics. So again, very grateful to, to the chamber and let's hear from them. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Vice President Chen Jingfen of China Chamber of Commerce of Metals, Minerals, and Chemicals, Importers and Exporters, I would like to share our views on China's fertilizer industry. I will first brief the development of China's fertilizer industry and then talk about China's production and exports of nitrogen and phosphate fertilizers in 2021 and close with the trends of China's fertilizer industry in 2022. The first part is about the development of China's fertilizer industry. Started from 1950s, after decades of that development, China has gradually transformed from heavy reliance on imports to self-sufficiency in nitrogen and phosphate fertilizers, and has now become one of the world's major exporters. However, there is a relative shortage of potential resources in China. Although China has become the fourth largest potential producer in the world, till now, 50% of its demand still depends on imports. The fertilizer import and export policies are also being constantly adjusted. China is actively enlarging the imports of fertilizers and high-end products that are in short supply in China. 
and meanwhile it lifted all export tariffs step by step. In terms of import, according to its WTO commitment, China has listed fertilizers as a commodity under the state-owned trade import management and designated enterprises for import operations. At the same time, import tariff quarters have been set for urea, DAP, and NPK compound fertilizers. As for export, since 2005, export tariffs have been imposed on major fertilizer varieties. In 2017, China abolished most of the tariffs, except fertilizers containing potassium elements. In 2019, all of the tariffs were cancelled. The charge below demonstrates the production, import, and export of China's major fertilizers. This slide shows the production of NPK from 2012 to 2020. The chart shows the production picked in 2015, reaching 74.3 million tons. From 2016, the trend of total production was declining due to the zero growth policy on fertilizer use, carbon emission, and other environmental protection policies. This is about the import and export of urea. Before 1998, China's urea import was far greater than export. Since 2000, China's urea export have soared, rapidly exceeding 1 million tons. China's urea export peaked in 2015 with 13.8 million tons. Since 2007, India has been the largest market for Chinese urea export. Subsequently, China's export to Mexico and other American countries have continued to increase. This slide shows the import and export of DAP. Since 2002, the import of DAP has decreased year by year, while the export increased. In 2007, China became a net exporter of DAP. The main export markets of China's DAP are in Asia, and they are also some to Australia and South America. This is for the import and export of MAP. China has become a net exporter of MAP since 2000. The exports have remained above 2 million tons since 2014, and in 2021 reached a record high of 3.8 million tons, and the main market were Brazil, Australia, and Argentina. This is the imports of MOP. As mentioned before, 50% of China's MOP demand relies on imports. From 2005 to 2021, the average annual import of MOP was 7.1 million tons, and the largest import volume reached 9.4 million tons in 2015. The second part is about the production and export of nitrogen and phosphate in 2021. As for nitrogen, according to the data from the National Bureau of Statistics of China, China produced 37 million tons of nitrogen nutrients in 2020, increased by 4.1% year-on-year. The output in 2021 is expected to be the same as in 2020. He also shows the exports of nitrogen fertilizers in 2021, the main export product or ammonia sulfate and urea, which accounts for 96% of nitrogen fertilizer exports. As for phosphate, according to the calculation of the China Phosphate and Compound Fertilizer Industry Association, the phosphorus nutrient output in 2020 was 16.3 million tons, decreased by 1.3%. The output in 2021 was 16.8 million tons, increased by 3.2. And here also shows the exports of main phosphate fertilizers, DAP, MAP, and TSP. The third part is about the trends of China's fertilizer industry in 2022. Firstly, let's see China's market in the first quarter of 2022. 
COVID-19 geopolitical crisis, price increasing of commodity and raw materials, multiple factors triggered the prices of agricultural imports rising rapidly. In March, the ex-works prices of urea, DAP, and MOP kept on rising. During this spring plowing, the Chinese fertilizer supply was relatively sufficient, but faced with high prices and tight supply of some varieties. In the first quarter, China exported fertilizers 4.1 million tons, declined by 30.9%. Except ammonia sulfate, the exports of urea, DAP, and MAP declined. Secondly, looking at the whole year, it's expected that the production and exports of nitrogen and phosphate fertilizers in China will decline in 2022. The production of potash fertilizer will remain stable with a steady increase, and the import price of MOP will rise significantly. The judgment is based on the following factors. The first is China pays more attention to the high quality development of agriculture and no longer simply pursues production increase of nitrogen and phosphate fertilizers. The second is China's development strategies and plans of the agricultural, the village, the environmental protection, and the fertilizer industry requires the improvement of production and practice technologies, accelerating the speed of eliminating outdated capacities. The third is China will expand the planting area of soybeans and oil seeds in 2022, which will increase the domestic demand for fertilizers. And the fourth is the sanctions on Russia and Belarus triggered the global tight supply of MOP, and the international market price of MOP repeatedly hit record highs. The Chinese government has relieved the tight domestic supply by releasing fertilizer reserves and other measures. It's expected that the MOP supply will remain basically stable throughout the year. This is what I would like to share with you today, and thank you for your attention. Thanks very much to the China Chamber of Commerce for this also very detailed presentation. The Chinese story is quite remarkable. As you heard, China was a major importer of fertilizers, and then in a, just in a few years was able to turn that around and became one of the most important exporters. And now we may be at the cusp of another transition. Um, it remains to be seen whether the expected decline in production and exports uh, that is foreseen for 2022 will set the course also for the future, but a very interesting space to watch. Um, the presentation discussed the fact that India is one of the largest markets for, or has been one of the largest markets for Chinese urea. So it's, it's actually a very nice uh, introduction of our next speaker. We now turn to India, uh, another very, very important fertilizer market, both in terms of um, uh, its own production, but also in, in terms of imports. Um, so delighted to have Rakesh Kapoor with us. He serves as the managing director of the Indian Farmers Fertilizer Cooperative, IFCO, which is a farmers owned fertilizer cooperative. In fact, it's the world's biggest cooperative. It has 35,000 member cooperatives reaching some more than 50 million farmers in India. And again, just to add a little bit more to that, uh, uh, IFCO produces 19% of Indian urea consumption and 31% of its phosphate uh, uh, consumption. Thanks for being with us, Rakesh. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in this uh, seminar. As uh, mentioned by Charlotte, I'm going to make a brief presentation on uh, Indian scenario on how the fertilizer market is being handled. Next, please. Next slide. India is a big importer of fertilizers, and as you could see, we import everything, raw material, intermediates, and also finished products. So 
Ammonia, 3 million tons. Urea, 10 million tons. Rock phosphate, 8 million tons. Phos acid, 4 million tons. DAP, 6 million tons. MOP, 5 million tons. So almost about 36 million tons per annum is our import of these commodities and uh, approximately more than $10 billion spent plus. Next, please. Annual consumption, if you see fertilizer was 62 million tons and uh, this has been a very important area from government perspective to ensure food security. And uh, we have 34 million tons of urea, 9 million tons of DAP, 2 million tons of MOP, NPK 11 million tons and SSP about 6 million tons. So uh, overall, uh, urea accounts for more than 50% of our total consumption and uh, average about CAGR of about 2% per annum has been observed in the fertilizer demand. And uh, if you look at food grain production also, unfortunately, this uh, slide doesn't carry the last year's figures, but uh, the production has also been gradually increasing year to year. More because of, uh, although the acreage under plantation remains the same, but better productivity and uh, I would say also improvement in our uh, fertilization and balanced fertilization have also helped. Then, next please. This is a slide which captures uh, in the last four years the production imports and sales. So urea, if you see the top graph uh, green, uh, which is the sales of urea, you know, there, there was an increasing trend. And especially as you would see in other slides also subsequently, 2021, we observed there was a sudden increase in demand. More so because in initial period of the COVID, first phase of COVID lockdown, people apprehended shortages and also there was over uh, buying and stocking by farmers in the field. And this trend you see even for DAP. But then going down uh, the line 21, 22, you see there has been a drop in sales, all the products, including uh, urea, DAP, and MOP. Overall, we import about 25, 30% of our uh, urea requirement. We have production capacity of 24 million tons and about 9 to 10 million tons we import. And urea manufacturing also, domestic manufacturing requires LNG because we have shortage of natural gas. So this RLNG is also regasified LNG is imported. About 65% of requirement is met through this uh, raw material. And that uh, the pricing, international pricing of gas going high also have uh, quite a lot of impact on the cost of production. Next, please. This is uh, again a tabular form of the same figures for better understanding, showing that there has been a drop in sales. Next slide, please. Now, urea pricing, if you look at it since uh, last 2022 year graph we have shown, uh, price had been more or less flat with a very marginal increase in between, if you see around 2010 12 period. Uh, so, farmer is still getting today urea at less than $80 per ton and we have been importing our requirements at $900 per ton and our own domestic cost of production also with higher gas prices has been higher ranging from $350 to $400 per ton. So, if you see the graph, the red one, the consumption has been going up gradually. Of course, there is a dip in the last 21-22 as we mentioned in the earlier slide. So this uh, much, uh, you know, non-increasing price of urea fixed 20 years back is uh, kind of responsible also for higher usage of urea being a cheaper uh, input. Next slide, please. This is a graph on DAP consumption. As I mentioned in urea, government has exercise their right to fix the MRP, retail price to the farmers, and though fertilizer industry is not allowed to increase, we are compensated by way of subsidy with government calculates by way of uh, normative norms, and that difference is paid with reference to cost of production or import. DAP, in 2010-11, this was partly decontrolled, and the policy was that market price is free, you will get a fixed subsidy every year per ton basis. So you see from 2010-11 onward, the DAP prices went up. They were oriented more towards market-driven prices with a fixed component of subsidy. 
but when this uh, 2021 uh, uh, you know the price went up in, in fact the input prices also went up phosphoric acid and all and then 21 22 again we had this uh, phenomena of tremendous increase in price their government stepped in a very aggressively and tried to insulate the farmers and therefore in the last two two and a half years industry has been sort of even if it's a decontrolled fertilizer industry has been pushed to ensure that there is no increase in retail price but government has come forward by way of higher budgetary support and compensating the difference by additional compensation next slide please this is uh, uh, in uh, his uh, presentation Theo also mentioned about the percentage increase in international prices so if you look at uh, between march 21 and march 22 this is how our price figures have jumped in terms of landed cost and some of them are FOB figures. So every every item of the fertilizer commodity chain has substantially gone up and this higher cost has not been transferred to farmers in the Indian scenario but has been compensated by way of higher subsidy by the government. Next slide please. This is again a trend which was also shown in another slide I think the China presentation in the COVID period, uh, if you look at uh, in its the first phase, the prices did not go up that much. But post March 21, the prices started going up. And uh, then, of course, now post February 22, after the Ukraine Russia war, this has been going up phenomenally. So, um, um, because of uh, price volatility, Farmers in India have uh, remained insulated. The prices have not gone up. In fact, DAP which we are selling today at 27,000 rupee per ton was uh, previously in 18, 19, it used to be sold at 28,000 rupees a ton. So there's in fact a lower price. Next slide, please. So this is a budget increase. I will go to the next slide uh, because of the time constraint which gives the like, overall this is breakup of that. So if you see this, this is how in the last uh, three years the subsidy as originally provided in the budget has been increased by the government. So 2021 from 9.4 billion dollar it went up to 16.9. This year 13.9 was the original budget estimate. This has already been increased to 22 billion. And if this price trend continues, we expect subsidy budget to go up to $32.5 billion. Next slide, please. And if you look at uh, subsidy as a percentage of the budget estimate, the year started with 2.7% provision of, out of the total budget estimates of the country, went up to 4.1%. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so this is uh, 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 after the conflict, recent conflict. This is how our two, for example, two main commodities, ammonia and urea, the prices have been going up. And uh, at this uh, uh, input price, for example, ammonia price and even phos acid and all, cost of production of DAP has been touching almost thousand dollars per ton. In fact, it is higher now with higher ammonia prices. So, uh, uh, so far, the supplies have not been impacted. Prices have, of course, been under pr uh, pressure. If these sanctions continue and the war continues, then uh, almost 3 million tons of ammonia from global trade would get cut off. So, we do anticipate uh, supply problems also going forward. As far as current scenario is concerned, it hasn't yet affected much in terms of uh, supply shortages. Next, next please, next slide. This is a slide uh, uh, presented by others also roughly giving the percentage of Russian contribution towards the export rate. So I will not spend much of time only saying that almost three, three and a half million tons of ammonia and 1.2 million ton of urea is imported from Russia to India. 
Next slide, please. This is on the DAP. This is overall, you know, region from which India is importing. For example, urea, if you look at it, 69% is coming from West Asia and East Asia, 7%, Africa, 10%, and Russia is about 11% and 3% from North America. So just to give a flavor of uh, different sources from which India is being, supplies are being met. Next slide, please. This is a China uh, imports. The, uh, although China had uh, put a ban on exports last year, but in the first half of last year till October, we were able to get supplies. Thereafter, also some supplies have been coming by exporters in China taking specific permission to export consignments. So, uh, so far it hasn't much affected. Um, uh, let's see how it happens. In the, uh, currently, the export ban is till 30th June. And uh, going forward, let's see if China relaxes that. Next slide, please. This is uh, again that how international prices have gone up and uh, the decline in sales. Uh, so government has been actually concerned about availability. They have been monitoring the overall situation on a weekly basis, calling the industry members at the highest level to meet with them, understand their problems. And uh, uh, so, so far, we haven't had any situation of shortages uh, in spite of higher international prices. Next slide, please. So uh, efforts have been on aggregating demand. We are, you know, our states represent their figures and then central uh, federal government uh, consolidates that. They have been reviewing company-wise production, import, supply plan. Monthly, they give district-wise fertilizer movement plan so that there are no shortages of fertilizer in any remote area. Close monitoring of production and import is being done. Railway rakes are being mobilized to ensure that there are no accumulation of stocks on ports and move material is moved interland and a subsidy payment to sell sellers are being ensured timely and uh, government to government level consultations are also being done by our uh, government to ensure adequate supply and signing some MOUs for continuity in supplies in future. Next, please. Uh, Rakesh, I'm sorry, we need to wrap up. Uh, just, uh, uh, I'll skip this. Next, just one more slide. Uh, so natural, coming to alternate strategies, we have, uh, you know, natural gas price is being compensated. Then the uh, balance use of fertilizer is being aggressively pursued. M more micronutrient uh, rich specialty fertilizer segments are being encouraged. There is a hike in, you know, we have minimum support price to incentivize farmers. And uh, also, uh, government is looking at opening up some exports of agri commodities to enable farmers to get advantage of the uh, higher international prices. And the last slide, next, please. One more. Thank you. Uh, so this is how, uh, you know, we have also been uh, talking of giving soil health cards to encourage balance uh, neutralization. And in the alternate products, for example, IFCO, we have developed a nano urea liquid fertilizer, which has given a very promising start. We have already sold uh, uh, around 21 million bottles last year. 500 ml bottle replaces 145 kg bag of urea. And this is getting very good response. So we are setting up, uh, uh, we have already set up one plant. We are setting up some more plants. Each plant will be producing around 50 million bottles a year, which is equivalent to almost 2.2 million ton of urea per annum. So with this product and also nano DAP, we have we are in the process of getting approvals to launch commercially. So these two products would be very useful from Indian government perspective to reduce substantially reduce subsidy bill. There is no subsidy on this nano urea and similarly on DAP. So subsidy savings and at, and at the same time higher NUE and also all those other uh, lower impacts on account of environment and water table degradation. Thank you very much. Th thanks very much, Rakesh. It's good news that there are no immediate supply concerns. Of course, that's probably explained by the fact that India is such an important market. And, and unfortunately, that's not the case for some of the African countries that we heard about earlier. Um, and then the obviously the other huge takeaway from your presentation is the mushrooming uh, subsidy bill uh, uh, facing the, 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 the government of India. Let us now move to another very important country, uh, one of our bread baskets, uh, Brazil. Really pleased to have with us Marcus Yank, who's a senior professor of global agribusiness at INSPIR in Brazil. He's had a very distinguished career, both in agribusiness and academia. 
And I'm also delighted to add that he was a member of IFPRI's Board of Trustees just until last March. Thanks for being with us, Marcus. Over to you. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you to everybody. It's a big pleasure to talk about fertilizers, which is a very key issue for Brazilian agribusiness. So um, just to, uh, just very quickly to start, uh, uh, we had very, very big accomplishments here in Brazil in terms of internationalization. Uh, Brazil is today the third world large, largest uh, uh, exporter. It's, it's, it's number five in total area. Uh, very, very huge innovations in tropical agriculture in terms of transformations of acid soils into fertile land, genetics, double cropping, no-till, crop livestock integration, and many other new, new techniques. And that's why Brazil is today the largest importer of fertilizers in the world, because we don't have enough fertilizers in the country. We have not been investing so much, and we are today very dependent on imports. Very high productivity rates, uh, rates here too, uh, and also uh, new agricultural frontiers, especially in the Cerrado. So a very big increase in terms of production and productivity. Productivity here in Brazil have been growing a lot in the last 10 years, especially because we have been exporting um, much more products here. You can see uh, the movement from 2000 to 2021 when we moved from $20 billion to $120 billion last year, a big increase after the pandemic. Uh, a very important movement here in Brazil is also uh, crop livestock integration. We have 90 million hectares of agriculture and we have 160 million hectares for pastures. And we are seeing today a very big expansion in agriculture into pastures, around 2 million hectares per year right now. So a big increase in agricultural areas uh, through crop livestock integration. And we still have a lot of pastures to be used. We estimated that crop livestock integration today is 17 million hectares here in Brazil, and it could move to 50 million hectares in the next 20 years. So that, uh, there's a huge potential here to increase production uh, horizontally. In on full screen mode, please, and advance the slides. You're stopped on the first screen. Ooh. Oh, sorry. Let me share again. Is it okay now? There we go. Okay, so. I have been talking about all these transformations. You have all the all the slides here, and you can see later. But the most important movement is crop livestock integration. So adding two two million hectares of agricultural land into pastures here in Brazil, two million hectares per year right now, uh, and this needs a lot of of uh, uh, of fertilizers here in Brazil. The movement is from doing just one single crop per year now to double cropping and crop livestock integration at the same time here in Brazil. So what's what's now the situation for, for the fertilizer uh, dependence here in Brazil? So you can see here that uh, consumption of fertilizers in Brazil have been growing a lot since the 90s, uh, moving from eight, uh, 8 million tons per year to 45 million tons last year. And the expectations for 2022 is 42 million tons. It will decrease a little bit because, uh, because of the high prices, most of the producers are now trying to optimize and use less, less fertilizers than last year. But 45 million tons is a lot of of, of products that we need, and almost 40 million tons are coming from imports. The Brazilian production is flat uh, or even uh, decreasing in the last years. We are now producing here in the country 7 million tons, and we are importing 39 million tons. And that's why Brazil is today the largest importer of fertilizers in the world. Um, the situation is that our, our dependence is growing uh, right now. Uh, Eighty-five percent is imported, and fifteen percent is produced locally. 
and here you have the situation of of the suppliers to brazil so because we are now uh, consuming 45 uh, million tons we depend very much on on just a few countries and the most important suppliers are russia china canada morocco belarus the united states and and some countries in middle east so very strong dependence in just a few countries and a, and a very specific dependence on china and belarus when we put china and belarus here we are talking uh, uh, on um, 26 percent 27 percent of our imports 23 percent coming from from russia sorry russia uh, and belarus and uh, and uh, 3.4 percent coming from from belarus so both uh, together go to 25 uh, 26 27 percent of our imports uh, the big problem that we have this year is that we concentrate the delivery of fertilizers in the second semester. So we need to buy now to have those fertilizers coming to the farmers when we start our crop season by September, October here in Brazil. So there's a strong concentration uh, of the need of fertilizers, especially in August, September, October and the usage on the second semester is much higher than on the first semester and that's why right now the farmers are very uh, worried about uh, the 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 risk of not having enough fertilizers uh, for the for the start of the next crop uh, 2022 2023 so uh, in terms of the conclusions uh, what's what's right now the situation so before the war we already had uh, a situation of a, of a combination of uh, high global agricultural prices. We also had a very important devaluation of the Brazilian real compared to the dollar, which means that uh, that the agricultural prices here in Brazil were were very high. But at the same time, we are seeing increasing global inflation and many supply chain challenges, not only in products but also in, in uh, inputs. Uh, rural producers have market incentives to increase production and the need uh, and uh, they need more fertilizers and and we are seeing right now very strong supply and demand imbalances not only in fertilizers but also in pesticides in machinery uh, energy and and some other uh, input uh, uh, goods and, and the situation right now what's what really uh, uh, very complicated for the farmers is that we are seeing much higher production costs in the country. After the, uh, uh, after the war, um, the situation right now, up to now, is that we don't see major fertilizer uh, shortages from Russia and Belarus, uh, but we have the risk of minor shortages, especially for small producers in the south of Brazil. So most of the center west uh, have already all the all the contracts to receive uh, to receive uh, uh, fertilizers this year, but we are seeing some risk of minor sh uh, sh uh, shortages uh, in south Brazil. Uh, the government and the private sector are trying to access other suppliers to reduce uncertainties. We see very high price volatility here in Brazil uh uncertainty in terms of the best time to buy inputs and potential losses uh, due to buy and sell mismatches uh, also some uncertainty about the availability of uh, fertilizers at the farm level to start the 2022 uh, 23 crop year farmers are also um, investing in terms of uh, alternative uh, uh, sources of nutrition, uh, first uh, doing soil fertility analysis and optimization of the usage of NPK, uh, liming, uh, no-till, green fertilization, organic inputs, but uh, as we saw in other presentations today, they will not replace the need of mineral fertilizers. And also uh, the government launched recently the Brazilian National Plan for Fertilizers, uh, and the target is, is to uh, increase the self-sufficiency from 15% uh, today to 45% up to 
to, to 2050. So this is the situation right now, very strong dependence on imported fertilizers and 25% of our imports are coming from Russia and Belarus, more than the, more than 25%. So it's a, it's, a, it's a situation that right now, uh, the only possibility is, 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 is really trying to uh, 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 optimize the usage of uh, uh, fertilizers and if uh, and if the global situation continues to be to be complicated we need to 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 try to find other sources other suppliers to reduce uh, uncertainties thank you very much thank you very much marcos for painting the picture of of how brazil is impacted by by this situation and what some of the the actions are to address it so we're moving into our Q&A session. We've got a lot of questions, so I'm going to try to move through them quickly. And, and please keep your answers uh, short if you can, so we can get through as many as we can. Um, I'm going to start with David Laborde. We've got a couple of questions about Russia and, and Ukraine and Belarus, and, and maybe you can just give us a, a big picture answer here. So can you clarify why fertilizer exports from Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine are hampered? And uh, one more forward-looking one, how can we prevent problems like this conflict uh, to affect fertilizer supply in the future? So, uh, thanks for the question. So the situation uh, regarding Russia and, and Belarus is a combination of various things. So on one hand, before Belarus, you had this sanction applied by the European Union uh, and, uh, and the US and a few other countries regarding the, the political violence that took place last year and the hijack of uh, a Ryanair plane. And uh, a country like Lithuania, for instance, has decided to not let uh, the potash companies of Belarus to use their railroad to access the Baltic port. So you have this kind of indirect uh, issue where Belarus still want to sell uh, potash, but you have a combination of, of, of situation that make it uh, actually uh, very difficult for them to do it. In Russia, you have a mix of, on one hand, Russia has put in place uh, some export restriction uh, as early as um, for the fall of last year, and in particular, following what China has done. And since then, they adjust their quota to what they think is the right size of export to maintain some um, fertilizer at home, but also still to, to supply some of the external market. So, and even just one week ago, they just increased a bit their quota, but they still manage it. At the same time, the traders have difficulties to operate with Russia today. On one end, maritime uh, shipment in uh, Black Sea have been totally disrupted with much higher cost. So even when uh, Russia wants to sell some fertilizer, there is less ships that will do it. Uh, and the sanction also uh, is putting some pressure on some operator that doesn't know how to handle it. So there's a mix of what Russia wants to do in terms of keeping fertilizer at home. Uh, and uh, their difficulty to, to export. Last but not least, right now, they seem that we have a declining demand of fertilizer for their own farmers, because also Russia is going through uh, actually the economic crisis. So they have a bit of surplus they want to sell. So you see different factors are, um, are uh, combined there, um, uh, leading to the situation. Now for the future, I mean, and it has been raised in the beginning of, of this uh, seminar that there is a need to diversify the source of fertilizer, both in terms of technology and location of production, but it has to be done in a rational way. You know, uh, you don't want to start to get crazy investment that will collapse after uh, the four years when prices will go down. Uh, and for me, yes, it's a much more supply side diversification mechanism than trying to force importers to buy from different places because at the end, you know, prices and profitability will matter for everyone. Um, and, and that's what uh, is pretty important. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, uh, David. Uh, Theo, we have a question from a fellow farmer from, from Kansas to you. Um, he or she's asking, if farmers could set the price for our products based on costs of operation instead of governments and markets, we would at least be able to afford what's available. Do you agree with that statement? Uh, sorry, you're on mute. <clears throat> Thank you. Farmers are price can you hear me now yes farmers are price takers unfortunately not price makers the only way we can become price makers if is if enough of us can take hands 
and organize ourselves well enough. But it is seldom that we get into that kind of situation. As we are now, you cannot imagine how many calls we get from all over the world where farmers say, is it even possible to survive these input prices? Is there any way in which we can ensure that what we get for our products can at least mat match the increased expenses on the input side? But remember, there is so, s such a long time between where we buy our inputs to where we get the money for our, our products. It is months, at least, that uh, many things can still happen in between. One thing which will not happen is with no miracle will we see the kind of supply which we expect in a few months of now uh, to, to meet the demand. So if you have planted or if you are planting now, you are in a good place. We know that no fairy is going to uh, bring a magic wand and, and, and just create the supply, which we expect with the less that has been planted up to now. Thanks, Theo. Um, Laura, let me turn to you um, with a question, and I think you were going to get into this if you'd had more time, but Aoife does such a great job of, uh, of looking at uh, supply and demand um, outlooks. What do you do in a situation that we're faced with today where it's so difficult to keep, keep abreast of uh, what's moving, what's being produced? Um, give us some insights in, into how you're able to do your job these days. Yeah, sure. Um, so it is, it's a completely unprecedented situation. If you're used to analyzing markets, then you tend to be able to rely on historical, uh, typical factors of the way that the market balances. So at EFA, the way that we would usually address forecasting the market is to start with demand, start with the agricultural fundamentals and the fertilizer requirements that there are in the world to feed the population and to generate a certain yield response. What we're actually doing this year, and this is in the run up to the publication of our five year forecast in just a few weeks time at the end of May, is we're actually having to flip that in the short term. So this is pretty much the only time in modern history, history at least going back to the 1970s, where we're expecting that there probably won't be enough availability in the world to meet those pre crisis expectations. So this is the first time, as I say, that we're actually changing that. We're going to be starting our forecasting process with supply availability. Again, that is riddled with lots of complications because of some of the export um, potential that David mentioned a moment ago. Um, but in the short term, that's really the only way that we're able to do this. There, there simply won't be a supply response quickly enough you know, to address some of the, the current season concerns. Thanks, Laura. A very unprecedented situation indeed. Um, Rakesh, we've had a question here that applies, I think, for many countries. So, so on the supply side, a major problem in some countries is about inefficiency of the domestic chemical fertilizer industry. Um, what's your comment on that? Do you think this plays into this um, situation we're facing now? Uh, it is uh, to a certain extent we can say that as one of uh, an important factor but and especially when you know the commodity is very highly subsidized so uh, uh, it does impact if you get urea cheap you tend to overuse it and this is what we have been witnessing in our country so p and k uh, consumption was lower than n but over a period of time, uh, I think by creating awareness amongst the farmers on ill effects of overusage and uh, some kind of attempt to see that the price difference between N and P and K on the other hand is not very high. And that's where they stepped in to uh, provide higher subsidy so that the ratio is not uh, distorted too much. So this is how uh, an attempt is being made to improve upon nutrient use efficiency and better balance fertilization. Thank, thank you, Barkesh. Um, and Marcos, a, a question for you. You are, of course, also an expert in international trade rules. Um, would you comment on, do you think that it's, it's going to be 
possible to impose some restrictions on, on or some rules, sorry, disciplines on export restrictions? I believe it's very difficult uh, because, uh, as you know, uh, the situation of the of the world uh, of the of the World Trade Association, uh, the World Trade uh, Organization, uh, is very complicated because uh, nobody is really believing on the on the possibility to have uh, to have decisions uh, at the appellation body today. So we've been. Um, uh, having some failures uh, in terms of things that we've been questioning at the WTO. And I don't believe that we are going to have a discipline for export uh, restrictions right now coming, coming from international uh, organizations. But I believe uh, on the other side that because of uh, uh, food insecurity and inflation in the world, especially in Middle East, in North Africa and other regions, if we have a, a situation like we had in 2008 uh, to 2013, uh, public opinion could go in the direction that we that we needed to facilitate uh, trade because the it's not only the problem of the fertilizers. We are now also uh, seeing the problem uh, of wheat uh, and uh, and also corn and other products that that are not uh, enough to supply. Uh, especially those very sensitive countries. Uh, the situation of the corn production right now in Ukraine is extremely complicated. And you see, if we have uh, very, very high wheat and corn prices for the whole year, we could have a movement to off countries, not at the WTO, but a kind of coordination, uh, trying, to, trying to minimize uh, the risks of uh, food insecurity and inflation. Thank you very much for your assessment. Sebastian, um, let's, let's focus a bit more on Africa in our last few minutes here. Um, a question is, what do you think are the top actions for African farmers given the, the high fertilizer prices? And then a second question has come in uh, asking whether the global fertilizer market might be uh, too monopolized, uh, especially in Africa where one company seems to control much of the trade. Do you have a comment on, on that as well? Okay, so on the first um, question as to what top actions need to happen for African countries. Well, as it stands right now, like I mentioned in my presentation, we are highly import dependent. So there is little that that could be done to. But I would really, really uh, emphasize on tracking of how fertilizer moves into this particular space, like Laura had mentioned. Having a key grasp on the demand and the supply sides will actually render um, most decision makers in Africa in a better position to make decisions really fast. We saw in 2021, uh, most of the demand, most of the demand destruction happening in countries in Africa because of delayed purchase decisions. So if you could have a lock on that, we will be in a better position to sort of circumvent this. Uh, on to the second question as to if there are companies that are monopolizing supply, I would beg to disagree uh, because in, in the, very varied markets that we are in as IFTC and as Africa for Lazar.org, we have seen a very cohesive and, and complementary role played by different companies, uh, all of them having different strengths uh, and all working together um, in the provision of fertilizers to African farmers. Thank you. Thanks, Sebastian. Let me thank all the speakers so very, very much for your presentations, for answering these questions. A big thanks also to the audience. A uh, very important topic, and I think we've highlighted a number of possible solutions, both in the short as well as in the longer run. Let me uh, let our uh, distinguished audience know that next Thursday on May 12th, we have another policy seminar at IFPRI. We will be launching uh, IFPRI's 2022 Global Food Policy Report, which focuses on climate change and food systems. Many thanks and have a good rest of your day or evening wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you.